My mission is simple, to make you money. I'm here to level the playing field for all investors. There's always a bull market somewhere, and I promise to help you find it. Mad Money starts now. Hey, I'm Kramer. Welcome to Mad Money. Welcome to Kramer America. Other people want to make friends? I'm just trying to make you some money. My job is not just to entertain you, but to educate and to teach you. Explain phenomenal days like today. So call me at 1-800-743-CBC or tweet me at Jim Kramer. All right, what the heck just happened? Was there really that much pent-up cash waiting to be put to work as long as Trump won the election? I am astonished to see such a powerful move higher. Dow surging 1,508 1, points. S&P skyrocketing 2.53%. And the Nasdaq pole voting 2.95%. It was if all the sellers in the world dried up and there were nothing but buyers. Buy, 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 buy. The market likes Donald J. Trump, and it loves a peaceful transition to the next president. We got both, and we had a monster buying celebration. It was a bull jailbreak, and the bears never knew what trampled them. Now, though, at the conclusion of this amazing session, we have to ask, have you missed the Trump rally? Is it a one-day wonder? Very reasonable to ask that. That's how much the market was up. And you know what? It depends on the stock. Some are sure to go higher. Some may have already reached their apotheosis, at least until we get some verification, because while Trump was elected last night, it doesn't take office until January. First, let's understand that many people thought we'd have a contested election, which would cause tremendous uncertainty. The fact that we already know the winner is a huge win for the stock market in itself, which makes it a magnet for new money. This election, with its vicious maelstrom of hate and fear, is finally over. And it's over in a peaceful way. Second, the animal spirits unleashed in the stock market today were so powerful that buyers ignored the truly hideous action in the bond market. Normally, when bond yields shoot up like this and rates really bolted higher, the stock market rolls over. Stock buyers today simply didn't care. I've never seen this before. Third, Trump wants to cut taxes, all taxes including corporate taxes, so numbers go higher. That's right, estimates go higher, earnings per share go higher. You do need to see interest rates stay low for things to really work. Someday, at least, it's going to matter. It's hard to keep doing this and piling on debt. But party on until we really see damage. That's what it felt like to me. Seems to be the mantra. Tax cuts will cause even more voluminous profits than we already have. Finally, we were coming, uh, we came in hot. But we were also still oversold, and many Trump stocks have been selling off because the, the narrative for the last few weeks, as you know, was that Harris was gaining momentum. How'd that happen? Well, I'll tell you how it happened. The polls. The polls were wrong again. We don't talk about that enough either, do we? That's another reason why we had this tsunami of stock buying. Money had come out because of Harris came back because of Trump. So with that prelude, what can still be bought? You know what I want to do? I want to take them in order of staying power. First, the rally in Tesla. That one has legs. I'm telling you, I can't believe it wasn't up much more. For Trump, politics is personal. He'll reward Elon Musk as much as he can, given the constraints of the law. Tesla does need some things. Musk wants full self-driving approval nationwide. You know what? Trump might push for interstate self-driving. Musk wants any break that unionized auto companies have. He can run the table against anyone in the space. This one goes higher. Two. The banks, especially the investment banks. These stocks had gigantic moves, moves that would normally take weeks or even months to occur, and, and instead they happen in a handful of hours. The banks have been pushed down for ages because the Democrats have tough, relentless regulators who love to go after the industry. Hey, you may hate the industry. You might want that. You may love it and say, what? Enough. The regulators have crushed their earnings power and their dividend giving and their buyback ability. That, in turn, really obliterated the price earnings multiple to the cheapest stocks in the entire market. Now, though, the banks could be unfettered. They might be able to merge again, reward investors with much higher dividends and buy back even more stock. More important, the investment banks can advise on many more mergers, and there will be many more mergers because the regulators will look the other way, and we will get more IPOs too. It's hard to convey how much antipathy there was between bankers and the Biden administration. They were oil and water. That's it. The banks have now run a lot. You got my blessing though to buy them if their stocks get hit on tomorrow's Fed meeting, which they usually do. For the Chapel Trust, we actually sold some of our shares. They be, these, became, these became some of our largest positions because they went up so much. I want you to sign up for the CBC Investing Club. You will see our reasoning. But overall, the group is still cheap. Did go parabolic. It will come down. You can buy. The Russell 2000 went crazy today. That's index buying, not individual stock buying. These moves rarely have legs because there are no buyers of the actual companies. 
So sellers of these stocks will come in, and they'll come in in the next three days. That said, the small cap rally is about repealing the thicket of regulations that you end up with under a Democratic administration. Of course, the most onerous regulations are state and local. But more Republican federal judges only mean more state-level regulations being overturned in court. As a small business person myself, I can tell you that the regulations have destroyed many more businesses than any other factor, including economic downturns. Any industrials, any transports went crazy today. That's because buyers sense that there could be a big wave of growth, as that's one of the pillars that Trump ran on. This one's a bit of a stretch because we've already had a huge rally in the industrials. I'll give you more on that later. We also have to accept that we will have another earnings season right at the time of the inauguration. So we'll have to worry about those earnings, too. But not yet. So there could be more big moves ahead, maybe after the market goes down, if the Fed says the wrong thing tomorrow, or if the president-elect says some things about the Fed that we don't want to hear. The president-elect wants to protect American industries. He should protect Nucor from Chinese steel, which is transshipped through Mexico right now. And Biden administration did nothing about it. I buy that stock of Nucor, even up here. Cleveland Cliffs and U.S. Steel should do well, too. They're not as good as Nucor, but they're good. Big tech got a real boost, especially the ones that have been hectored by antitrust, like Alphabet or Amazon or, or frankly, even Apple and maybe even, we thought, maybe NVIDIA and Meta. Now, these, look, if you make companies, if your companies make goods in China, like Apple, that could be tough because, you know what, China and Trump, they are also like oil and water. And if you do business there, it's going to hurt you here. However, uh, because this is a more popular time for um, it's a popular time for Trump, okay, and a less popular time for China. Of the tech stocks, the strongest for the cybersecurity place. There's a sense that a Trump presidency will bring more hacks. Probably won't, though. This one will do best Palantir. It's upending the Pentagon procurement process and making it possible for us to play offense when it comes to cybersecurity. President-elect Trump's going to have a lot of fun with Alex Karp, the co-founder and CEO of Palantir. That can go much higher. I don't care about the valuation. I know it's a popular stock. It can go higher. Trump likes winners. He likes success stories. That means he'll like NVIDIA. Remember, Trump's all in with Elon Musk. He knows that Musk respects NVIDIA's Jensen Wong. Good stock to own, not to trade. I'd also buy Meta here. There's all sorts of bogus scuttlebutt about how the president-elect and Mark Zuckerberg don't get along. I think that's the old days, people. I believe things have gotten better between the two, and you should think more about the fundamentals now, which are fabulous. They talk that, look, there's some common ground between the two. It was silly that the stock wasn't up as much, but people were worried about the two of them being angry at each other. No. Oil and gas went nuts today. You need the commodity to go higher for this one to keep working. These companies might choose to drill more, but they've gotten more disciplined since the last time Trump was president. I do know this. One of the most destructive things that Biden did was call for a pause on pending approvals of liquefied natural gas exports. It crushed a lot of plans. They'll be revived, leading to all sorts of new energy infrastructure, including pipelines. I love the pipeline stocks, and I like the natural gas stocks because of the pending repeal of that federal mandated pause. I like the refiners, think Valero, Phillips 66, and Marathon Pete, because I thought we were going to have a Democratic field day against these three. Nope, not going to happen. No. Health insurers deserve to run every one of them. I think the Republicans now have enough votes to get rid of whatever the health insurers deem to be onerous about Obamacare. Huge windfall. I like United Health because it always does well anyway. Plus, the new team at CVS, which owns Aetna, just got a gigantic break. Finally, I have to say that crypto has the president-elect, and he'll try to create a strategic reserve of Bitcoin, which is fantastic reason to buy crypto, buy Robin, buy Coinbase, and buy crypto stock your micro strategy. My advice to crypto opponents, you lost. Move on. If you ask me how much this rally was a relief at the conviction of, I believe, at the possibility of a contested, contested election, Uh, versus the policy of President Trump, President-elect Trump, I should say. I'd say that when you have a president who favors higher stock prices, as he told me many, many times, and wants lower interest rates, I'd say it's probably about 75% Trump, 25% relief. But the ironic bottom line is it'll be tough to exceed the Biden regime when it comes to the stock market. Biden was no friend of stocks, but the market went up anyway. Who knows how high they can go with a president-elect who always told me that the Dow Jones Industrial Average was his version of the Nielsen ratings. Let's go to Chuck in North Carolina. Chuck. Booyah, Jim. Booyah, Chuck. Thanks for taking my call again. Uh, I'd like, uh, I do not have a position in this stock, but I would like your opinion on McDonald's MCD. I'm considering adding it to my portfolio. 
Um, I like McDonald's, but I don't know if you caught last night's show. We had uh, Texas, this uh, Texas Roadhouse one yesterday, uh, TXRH. And I don't know about you, if you got that, maybe if you just maybe you can call it up on CNBC.com or something. But it was incredible. And it's making me rethink the restaurant group. I think Texas Roadhouse is a better stock to own than McDonald's. Let's go to Robert in New York, please. Robert. Hey, Jim. How's everything going tonight for you? No, not bad. How are you? Very, very good. It's nice to talk to you again. I love talking to you. But uh, oh, I, you. I know you got a lot, a lot going on here, so we're going to get right to business tonight. Okay? All right. Let's do that. So, let's do that. All right, good. Jim, this next company has gone up over 36% in the last six months year to date, almost almost 50%. It's reached its all-time high today at $996 a share. It's a milestone with the company's robust performance and investor optimism in growth potential. They raised their full year 2024, Jim, uh, subscription revenue forecast at $10.65 billion. And $10.66 billion, okay? They, their AI technology has landed some huge contrast. Despite the concerns about the partnership with Carousel, their Fed business is unaffected. Now, Jim, this is very important for your listeners. On May 15th, you asked, somebody called in and asked, what should I do? And you know what you said? I don't have it in my travel check, but I would buy, buy, buy. And it was $760. And what do you think I did? What do you think Rock from New York did? Of course he bought it because Kramer said to buy it. The company is service now. Service now, baby. Uh, all right, I'm gonna I'm gonna use right now new price target. Okay, I'm gonna say the stock goes to 1,200. It's at 994. It's going to 1,200. It's probably one of the best stocks in this entire market to buy. You have my blessing to keep it until 1,200 dollars. Look, it will be a tough to beat this market performance that we just had under Biden. But there's no tell how there really is no tell how how high it could go under President like Trump, given his pension for higher stock prices and the fact that he roots for them to go higher. And not only that, unlike Biden, he actually knows it exists. Oh man, money tonight. Fresh off news of the next White House occupant. I'm diving deeper into what could be the incoming administration's positives about MA and negatives about antitrust and how your portfolio could be impacted. Then this summer, I gave Cummins the top spot in my new industrials list. After hitting another high today, I'm seeing if the stock still has room to run or if there could be some headwinds on the horizon. Plus, just yesterday, you called in on an under-the-radar name called IES Holdings. I didn't have much to do, so I decided to give it a look-see. So stay with Kramer. Don't miss a second of Mad Money. Follow at Jim Cramer on X. Have a question? Tweet Cramer. Hashtag Mad Mentions. Send Jim an email to madmoney at CNBC.com or give us a call at 1 800 743 CNBC. Miss something? Head to madmoney.cnbc.com. Today, the market got to work processing the shockingly strong victory for President-elect Trump, trying to figure out winners and losers on the fly. I think some of these verdicts were wrong more than that later, but there was one theme in today's action that feels really right to me. With Trump's antitrust regulators, mergers and acquisitions are about to come back in a big way. It was a, it's a huge deal, as this was one of the longest M&A dry spills in modern history. Takeovers are a major reason why people like you and I own stock. My for my trust, you for your per, 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 portfolio. And I've got to tell you, Biden's regulars practically tried to shut down the takeovers, and it, it really crimped how much you could make. You saw this all over the tape today. Capital One's acquisition of Discover Financial Services hasn't been formally challenged by the Biden administrator. But I've got to tell you, many of us assumed it would face that kind of real scrutiny. That's kept a little in Discover stock. Today, with the antitrust overhang now seemingly gone, Discover roared 20 percent, making it the largest winner in the S&P 500. And even the acquired Capital One shot up 15 percent. In fact, Synchrony Financial, another credit card issuer focused on lower end consumers, jumped almost 19 percent today, making it the second biggest gainer in the S&P 500. These three companies are something of a triumvirate in the lower end segment of the credit card market. If the deal goes through, it becomes a two man game, meaning much less competition, meaning bigger profits, meaning 
big gains for shareholders. But it's not just deals. Live Nation Entertainment, which owns live music venues, produces concert tours, also runs Ticketmaster, saw its stock rally 7%. The Justice Department, along with 30 states and district attorneys general, sued Live Nation and Ticketmaster this past spring for, in their words, quote, monopolization and other unlawful, unlawful conduct that thwarts competition in markets across the live entertainment industry, end quote. According to a recent update, that civil case isn't expected to happen in 2026. But will the new Trump administration's Justice Department pursue it as strongly or even at all? Today, the Marcus wager is the answer is no. So which sectors look better now that M&A is effectively back on the menu and the Justice Department's antitrust division seems like it'll be far less aggressive in its pursuit of big business? First, I think this is a huge deal for the regional banks. The financials were the best performing sector in the entire market today, up more than 6%. Now, some of that's because this group will benefit from a lighter regulatory touch from Washington. But I also think mergers are a huge part of the equation because some of the stronger regional banks can either grow incrementally by acquiring smaller banks in their services or maybe grow more aggressively by combining with each other to become super regionals with the scale to compete with the big national players like Bank of America, City, J.P. Morgan, Chase, Wells Fargo. Ever since the financial crisis, any kind of bank deal has gotten extra scrutiny to the point where most of the regionals seem to have given up on M&A. Don't be surprised to see that trend change. What else? I think there could be a lot of benefit from further tie-ups in the energy sector, especially among the exploration, production, or EMP players. Aside from an affinity for tariffs, one of the main things we know about Trump's energy, economic plan is that he plans to be much more friendly to domestic energy producers. You, you could say drill, baby, drill is back. That's it. Freeing up oil and gas companies to boost production might not actually help their stocks because higher production means lower prices. And one of the great ironies of the past eight years, energy stocks have done far better under Biden than they did under Trump. The S&P Energy ETF, the XLE, is up 205 percent since the 2020 election, but it was down 57 percent from when Trump got elected to when Biden got elected. Now, uh, but this time, would it be different? I don't know. Uh, if they allow more energy, uh, oil and gas deals to m- see more mergers, creating some powerful mid-sized E&P companies with better balance sheets that can have more influence in the industry, then the answer is that energy can make a big comeback. Finally, there is my industry, and this is what we spent some time on, the media communication sector. This is an industry that's trying to retrench, find a sustainable way forward, following a long period of disruption and not great numbers. Now, we've got Netflix disrupting television. We've got T-Mobile and Starlink disrupting broadband. Tough environment. But one thing's for certain. Many of the legacy players in the media space could benefit from joining forces. Could we see some of the smaller independent companies like Paramount, which already has a penny acquisition from the Ellison family, combine uh, part of it, maybe combine some or all of it with Warner Brothers Discovery? Maybe our parent company, Comcast, does a deal to acquire the struggling charter communications to improve its scale in home broadband. I've seen speculation on this, but I have no particular insight into Comcast's decision making. I do know this. The Biden administration has been incredibly hostile to consumer-facing acquisitions like these. But Trump's second term will likely have much less. They're just not interested in blocking these kinds of deals. They probably don't see what's wrong with them. Again, it's not just M&A. There's also the antitrust enforcement side of the equation. I think it's safe to say that some of the companies we, we already knew were under scrutiny are incrementally in a better place today, and that includes Apple which was sued by the Justice Department earlier this year, and NVIDIA, which was widely reported to be facing antitrust scrutiny from the Biden Justice Department, I think because they're doing so well. But given the more fickle nature of normal antitrust reviews, which are basically at the discretion of the regulator, I have to add a caveat here. While I think the nation's largest companies are likely safer from antitrust scrutiny, that's only so long as they stay on the right side of President-elect Trump. Remember, one of the few times the first Trump administration chose to use this antitrust authority was when it sued to block the ATT Time Warner merger back in 2017, primarily because then President Trump didn't care for CNN, which was a part of Time Warner at the time. So it's not a surprise to see most of America's big name tech CEOs come out today with enthusiastic public messages of congratulations for President elect Trump. Alphabet Sundar Pichai even he even included a nice picture, which I'm sure Trump will appreciate. And remember, Trump and Meta Zuckerberg have gotten on good terms. So here's the bottom line. The market's doing its best to sort out the winners and losers from the election of Donald Trump for a second term. I think people are getting a lot right with some big mistakes thrown in. But I am very confident in the idea that under President Trump, M&A is about to come back and back bigly. 
Companies will no longer have to fear super strict antitrust scrutiny so long as they stay on the right side of our mercurial president-elect. And let's be real clear about something. The CEOs I talk about all the time behind the scenes across the board always speak about the tyranny of the FTC and the Justice Department. As of yesterday, that tyranny is over. Everybody's back after the break. Coming up, is this old industrial learning some new tricks? Cummins hits a new 52-week high today, and Kramer's reviewing his bull case for the energy transition play. Next. Yesterday morning, I was filled with anticipation, not just for the election. I couldn't wait until Cummins reported for the bell. Because this engine maker with a big business selling backup generators to the data center has become one of my favorite stocks. Thankfully, unlike vote counting, earnings results tend to be right on schedule. And sure enough, Cummins reported a true blowout. When the Senate stuck up nearly 9% yesterday to a new all-time high. All aboard! So tonight, I'm going to walk you through just... Just how this seemingly old school engine maker that I like so much could put together an amazing quarter in the middle of a freight recession. Something that tends to be real bad for trucks. We heard from our business the other day. But here's the thing. While Cummins is best known for its truck engines, Class A truck sales were down more than 16% in the first half of the year. And the business doesn't seem to be picking up in the second half. Maybe this definitely isn't what led the stock higher. I highlighted this one over the summer, recommending Cummins as one of our so-called new industrials, a list that you like so much. Not new as in freshly created, but new as in newly reinvented. See, this stock held up remarkably well earlier this year when the whole economy seemed to be slowing. And we still had no idea when the Fed would start cutting rates or how fast it would start doing that. That's because Cummins has two lines of business that don't have much exposure to the business cycle at all. It's a smokestack industrial with some what we call secular growth exposure, making it less hostage to the broader economy. For starters, the company's made sure that it's part of the energy transition story as it's developing a balanced portfolio of lower carbon solutions. Notice I said lower, not low, not high, but lower carbon solutions that actually work right now. Some of this lower carbon stuff is pie in the sky, but Cummins has a natural gas-powered engine platform that's way better for the environment than diesel or gasoline. They're also working on electric and even hydrogen fuel cell-powered engines. That's the cleanest fuel of all. I'm a big fan of the transition to cleaner energy, even if that whole industry is likely to get less federal funding under Trump. At the same time, Cummins has been very smart about this move, easing into the energy transition at a more measured pace than, say, the automakers, and even walking back some of its long-term targets for the zero-carbon business back in May. As much as I like the theme, customers need solutions for the business today, not 10 years from now, and the customer's always right. So I'm glad Cummins is willing to make the energy transition at the same pace as their customers. More important. There's the second reason I recommended Cummins over the summer, and that's their power systems business. Think generators, commercial power systems for buildings. Not a bad business to be in right now, right, with a data center build-out boom. Keep in mind the hyperscalers are spending obscene amounts of money on these data centers. I think even more maybe than, uh, like, say, the brisket at Chipotle. So they really can't afford to cut costs when it comes to backup power sources. And why would they? After all, the hyperscalers aren't exactly strapped for cash, are they? Raising the CapEx budget for the project by what could be seen as rounding error makes a ton of sense if it can ensure better protection against potential downtime. And that's exactly what Cummins gives them. Lovey blanket. So between the longer-term energy transition theme and the strength of the current business, I gave you the go-ahead to buy some shares back in August. Now the stock's up 11.6% from then, uh, heading into yesterday's quarter. So that was Good call. But with Cummins hitting new all-time highs as we move closer to earnings, I was curious to see how much of, the, of my positivity was already baked into the share price. So what happened yesterday? Well, at first glance, the company turned in nicely better than expected revenue with four of their five largest divisions beating the estimates. Cummins also delivered some tremendous margin expansion, which is how they could earn $5.86 per share. Wall Street was only looking for $4.82. Mammoth beat. I was especially interested in that power systems business, see how it would perform, and it didn't disappoint. Power systems crushed the expectations. And I was looking for $1.3 billion in revenue, and Cummins is in a staggering $1.6 billion. That is significant. Nearly 17% growth, and the analysts are expecting a 5% decline. The main driver of this upside surprise was the demand for power generation equipment in North America and around the world, fueled by what management said was, and I'm going to quote, continued strong data center and mission-critical power demand. Yep, the data center again. 
Now, despite a softy in the North American heavy tr- uh, duty truck market, some people would have sent this stock down by about 25% in the old days. I remember it was anticipated. The strength in both these segments from the pricing and volume perspective translated into strong profitability, allowing management to raise their full year EBITDA forecast. Now, while the energy transition business wasn't a major driver of the upside, management still took the time on the conference call to share some these highlights for future projects. Specifically, Cummins started full production to think called the X-15 and natural gas engine during the quarter, which they believe will be an excellent alternative for truck fleets that are looking to significantly reduce their carbon footprint. Uh, UPS seems to think so. I mean, they just ordered, uh, they purchased 250 Kenworth trucks powered by the X-15N, which the company highlighted as an important step in the decarbonization of its ground fleet. So that's how Cummins was able to jump nearly 9% yesterday. But today brought a lot of hectic action in the market due to the president uh, returning to Pennsylvania Avenue, President Trump. On a day with lots of big winners and a few big losers, Cummins actually stood out with a generally flat reaction, ultimately rallying by less than 1%. What does a second Trump term mean for Cummins? In the latest quarter, the company got over 56% of its sales from the United States. On the international side, only 9% of their sales last year came from China. That's good news. Right now, revenue from China by itself isn't much of a concern. That shouldn't be impacted by any additional tariffs. Nevertheless, those sales could be at risk if there are any retaliatory tariffs by the People's Republic. But the bottom line, don't let today's hectic action take away from the reasons we like Cummins in the first place. This company is still involved in the transition to cleaner energy and the great data center build out. Two powerful long term themes, the great tailwinds of this era that I still believe in. Given that I expect this week to be volatile, I say hope for some craziness that will give you a discount in the incredible quarter Cummins just reported. And yes, if there's a meaningful dip, call me a bye, bye, bye. buyer. Let's go to Rich in New York. Rich. Hey, Mr. Kramer. It's nice to talk with you again. Same to you. Same here, Rich. What's happening? Well, we need your thoughts, Jim. Uh, I don't believe sure. retail investors. Uh, let me start again. I don't believe retail investors are selling this stock at this level. And it used to be a darling stock. Uh, but I do think institutional investors are still selling uh, the Boeing company. Um, why aren't they getting behind this, this stock uh, now that the strike is settled and uh, the company should be on its way forward. You know, I have to tell you, Rich, I was myself looking at the action in the stock today, and I was a bit puzzled. I think that you're right. The institutions that got it on the deal feel like it was priced in the hole. They're b- booking some gains, getting gains and gains. But I think they should stop selling. I know the earnings power has been hurt by the big dilution. But you and I both know it's a duopoly with Airbus, and they're going to come back. And I think at this level, it should be bought, not sold. Let's go to Chris in Connecticut, please. Chris. Jim, thanks for taking my call. Of Third course. Time caller. Whoa, Jim, with the AI build out taking place, I'm just thinking about um, companies that are going to be servicing uh, cooling rack systems, did digital infrastructure with Vertiv VRT be a player in that industry. Vertiv is the number one player in that industry, and that is chaired by Dave Cody. We've had them on. They are a terrific company. And I think if you believe in the data centers, I do. You have a winner, Chris, and thank you for calling in three times. Good question. Now, Cummins is firing on all cylinders, and given its ties to some favorable long-term tailwinds, not Class A trucks, which is, the trucks are not doing well. I recommend grabbing more shares of this name on pullback, and of course, I want that CEO back on. Wow, hitter. Man, money had tons, including my look at an industrial play, IES, that you asked me about. It's up 300% for the. Three percent run up. Oh my, what a market! Then, did stocks like First Solar really deserve to dip during today's post-election trading? I'm telling you, if I think these moves are just fine. Of course, all your calls rapid fire tonight is the lightning round. So stay with Kramer. Last night during the lightning round, I got a call from Anthony in California. He wanted to know about something called IES Holdings. It's a quiet industrial services company that I knew by reputation. I told him I liked it, but also said I wanted to take a closer look at it and come back with a more complete analysis. Since there wasn't much going on at all last night, was there a totally normal evening? And we had a little space today's show, of course. I said, I'll get right on it. 
Well, let me start with some quick background on this company, IES. While its roots date back 60 years, the company Modern History really kicked off in 1997. A group of electrical contractors joined forces to form a business called Integrated Electrical Services. That was the name until they abbreviated to IES eight years ago. Really boring name, not boring company. Now, in 2006, IES went bankrupt, but it emerged from bankruptcy in the same year with the creditors taking most of the entity uh, equity in uh, and, and you know what? A reorganized company looked pretty good. When you look at the chart since that return to public markets in 2006, what you see is a whole lot of nothing for years and years, leading up to an incredible explosion higher, especially over the last couple of years. Two, two years ago, this stock was in the mid-30s. Now it's at $263. How great is the stock market? All right, this move seems like it came out of nowhere because IES has been totally under the radar. But not a single analyst follows this company, not one. So there's no research, no upgrades, no downgrades, no consensus estimates. Nobody's asking any questions on the conference call. In fact, they don't even hold a conference call. They just put out a press release with a slide deck every quarter, kind of like what Warren Buffett does, you know, that except for, well, there's only one Warren Buffett. When a stock doesn't get much attention and it turns hot, it can generate these monster rallies once people start noticing it. So what's been driving this move? Okay, IES designs and installs integrated electrical and technology equipment, as well as handling plumbing and climate control. They do this for residential housing, for commercial and industrial facilities. And yeah, come on, you know what, what's really driving it, driving it. The data center. Can you believe this data center theme? Isn't it incredible? I've never seen anything like it. Over the years, IES has been rolling up small contractors all over America to the point where they now have more than 9,000 9, employees, 125 locations. Most of their business still comes from housing. Last year was 54% of sales. But 25% of their sales came from communications, which includes all those data centers, and that's a business that is booming. When you look at the numbers, IES has been growing like a weed in recent years. Just in the first nine months of 2024, they put up 22% revenue growth. While their operating income has more than doubled up 112%, their adjusted earnings per share grew by 130%. And this is when the Fed's tightening. The strength here is broad-based with double-digit growth for each of the company's four segments. We're talking 51% growth, 51% for the rim structure business, 41% growth for commercial industrial, 29% for communications, and the largest segment residential almost feels like it's holding the rest of the company back with a 10% growth rate. Then again, residential should really pick up when the Fed starts cutting rates in earnest, maybe tomorrow. IES can put up numbers like these because it's propelled by some powerful secular tailwinds. They've benefited from the strong housing market in recent years, and that's only going to get stronger as rates come down. Keep in mind, IES is concentrated in Texas, Florida, Georgia, North Carolina, and Arizona, where we've seen a lot of population growth. On top of that, IES, as I mentioned, is a data center play. There are three non-housing businesses all serve in the data center in various ways. Telco equipment for communications, power infrastructure for commercial and industrial, custom engineered products and gener- like generator enclosures from the infrastructure division. They also gotten a bunch of businesses from new warehouses, fulfillment centers built for e-commerce, as well as capital projects intended uh, meant to stabilize the power grid in this age of high electricity demand. Oh, my God, these are good businesses. Now, the final piece of the puzzle is regular M&A. Remember, this is a roll-up. It thrives by acquiring lots of smaller companies, rolling them up. They've made some very smart deals in recent years, like picking up that generator enclosure business with the acquisition of a company called Wet Lake in 2021. Uh, just as the AI boom was about to take off. Lucky, better than being good. IES has a standard M&A playbook. When they require new companies, they can quickly integrate those businesses and cut costs, hence the rapid earnings growth. So there, that's a more thorough overview of IES holdings than I could have given Anthony last night. I wish I'd been paying closer attention to this one, but it just wasn't on our radar screen, including for my club, in part because it was so small before its recent rally, and in part because there's zero sponsorship in Wall Street, meaning I can't find any quick research. All that said, what the heck do you do with IES holdings now? Oh, it is a great business, but the stock's had a huge run, including a monster 7% gain just today as part of the broader Trump rally. The darn thing's up 233% year-to-date, more than 1,200% over the past five years. Clearly, the market thinks it's, it's going to thrive during the second Trump administration. However, I might be inclined to say, uh, you know what, actually, how about a little registry? You already own this one? I'm not saying sell the whole thing, no, but if you've got a massive game, the responsible move is to take some profits, take some winnings off the table. If you don't own it already, then you know what you're going to have to do? You have to wait on the sidelines and get a lower entry point. It's too high. While I still think IES is a fabulous story, I'm a little concerned about the company's exposure to the housing market, which could go from tailwind to headwind if long-term interest rates keep climbing. Remember, the Fed controls the short end, not the long end. And that's certainly been the bond market's response to the Trump win. On top of that, there's this valuation issue. 
I asked now sales from north of 30 times earnings. That's trailing estimates. We can't use forward estimates. Why? Because we, we usually do because there are no estimates for this one. We can't just make them up. Historically, IS has sold for more than like 17 times earnings, so it's certainly not cheap here. As a matter of fact, when you look at it against itself, it's just too expensive. Then again, the company got much better growth than it had in the past. There's some premium, but I hate to chase. Stocks had a staggering run. We're not going to chase on this show. So here's the bottom line. First, kudos to Anthony in California and any others out there. I know Anthony's called a couple times. He's a smart fella who found IES holdings on their own and recognized the stock's potential early. They deserve their winnings. The company has a great story. But if you own it already, I'd bring the register on part of your position at these altitudes. If you don't own IES and you want some more uh, or you want to start buying some, I say, could you please wait for a pullback? Give you a better buying opportunity. Believe me, if long ways keep climbing like they did today, I'm telling you, I know it doesn't seem like on a day with a Dow's up so much, but you're going to get your chance. Man Money is back after the break. Coming up, Kramer takes your calls. And the sky's the limit. It's a fast fire lightning round. Next. That's what we're about. Let me say this. Bye, bye, bye. Sell, sell, sell. Let me say this. We're after the buy. You play this out. And then the lightning round is over. Are you ready, Ski Daddy? Time for the lightning round. Okay, everybody, start with Bill. Not just Bill. Jimbo, how are you today, my friend? Uh, I'm doing well, Bill. How about you? Oh, crazy week, crazy week. Finally, it's over. We have a president. Imagine that. Well, it's better than nothing. How can I help? There you go. There you go. Uh, I just wanted to ask your opinion on this equity. It's kind of, uh, didn't make uh, revenues in its last quarter, but I feel like with the Fed, accommodating Fed and the uh, infrastructure uh, laws going into effect, I think it could do well. I'm thinking about URI, my friend. All right, now that did go up 10% today. We actually was almost doing a piece about it. That's a very big move, sir. And I am afraid to recommend it on top of 10% move. This one now needs a pullback, and that's what you're going to have to wait for. Let's go to Bruce in Illinois. Bruce. Good job, Jimmy. How's it going, hey, man? Jimmy, I'm, it's good, man. Thanks for taking my car. Sure. I'm a small position in a company that pays a 16% dividend and has earnings of $1.33 a share. Should I buy, sell, or hold XP Incorporated? investment management company. We don't really know what they're up to inside. I'm going to say no. I want you to buy BlackRock instead. Just buy one share of BlackRock. I'll feel much better for you. Let's go to Thomas in Georgia. Thomas! Jim, I own uh, Palo Alto, CrowdStrike, and Okta. And with the run-up in the former, the two former, I'm uh, heavily overweighted in cyber. Is there any reason to hold on to Okta? Is there a cap? Uh, no, not with those stocks. I think you just own the best and leave the raggedy r- others to the rest. That's what I say. You don't need that one. Let's go to Rahul in New Jersey. Rahul. Jim Puya from uh, Jersey City, not too far from your pad. And oh, my God. And also neighbors. Neighbors, alum. neighbors. Fantastic. What's going on? And, and a fellow Crim- Crimson alum, too. Uh, wow. So quick question. You're following me. <laughs> with, the, with the ongoing energy transition, nuclear greening traction, um, and uh, all this team into pushing to sustainable data centers. How do you see Talon Energy versus its competitors? I think Talon, I know they got that setback the other day from FERC. It doesn't matter. They're in good shape. I like it very much, and I would encourage you to own at least one of these with a constellation with the Talon. I think this is with Vista. I think these are good. Let's go to Frank in New York. Frank! Hey, Jim. Thanks for taking my call, Jim. Oh, Listen, my I pleasure. Wa- I bought this stock a while ago, Jim. Everyone says, the whole world, we need more memory, we need more memory. And it just lays there. And people put, oh, 140, 170, all these high things. Finally today, it broke out a little. Do you think it's over the hump now? It's going to get recognized, Micron, and for what it is? Uh, I is- think Micron's ridiculous. At 92, 93, I pounded the table. I did it again at 98. Even Sanjay Marotra, who's the CEO, thought maybe I was too bullish about Micron, but you can't be. I think the stock goes much higher. I like you in the stock. Let's go to uh, Tanuj in Ohio. Tanuj. Hey, Grim. How are you? I am well. How about you? I'm doing very well. Booyah. And, Booyah. Uh, I have a question for you on Lemonade. I'm holding this stock. I bought it at $50 a few years back. I have 100 of them. It suddenly get a momentum. What should I do with that? 
I think this is a real short squeeze. I got to tell you, I mean, the numbers were okay, but it's just a giant uh, group of people were betting against it and they got it wrong. And you know what? I, in any other tape, I would say ring the register. In this tape, there's probably another couple days that this continues. So let's wait till Friday and then maybe take some profits. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is the conclusion of the Lightning Round. The Lightning Round is sponsored by Charles Schwab. Coming up, with the 2024 election decided, stocks soared in today's session, while some sectors sold off. Kramer is revealing the names he thinks didn't deserve the steep decline. Next. Jim Kramer, the diehard of the dollar. Hey, Jimmy, love the show. My five-year-old grandson loves to watch your show. I have to thank you for making us money when it's there to be made. Our world is a better place with you in it. talked about the big winners from Trump's victory. But we always have to ask if there's anything that's been thrown away that shouldn't have been. The proverbial babies with the bathwater. I see a bunch of them. Let's start with solar. President-elect Trump pokes fun at solar, but in the last debate, he said he's a big fan of solar. When it comes to energy under Trump, what matters to him is whether it's American-made. If it is, then it can thrive. Take first solar. Did you know that First Solar is the only major solar company based in the U.S. and has multiple plants in the country? I don't think it's a sell with the stock down nearly 22 today. I prefer to buy it. Same goes for Nextracker, a solar technology company based in the United States that's getting just hammered. It makes solar fields more efficient, sources 100% American. That's why you own it for the Chapel Trust. No, I don't expect subsidies from Washington for alternative energy anymore. That said, it's very clear that we need a lot more electricity in the country, and half the new power added to the grid is solar, because it's the most cost-effective form of energy now. Why would it be punished unless it's part of the Chinese import situation? Fortunately, first, solar and next tracker are, as I say, all American. Costco got knocked out earlier today with the rest of the retailers. That's nonsense. Costco's about membership fees. They pass on any savings they can, can to the customers. So they're going to be the cheapest of any retailer, and they take share if imported groceries get hit with tariffs. It's simply incorrect that Costco's being treated like the other retailers. If anything, you should layer into this one for the long term. It might be open. Let's say it opens down tomorrow. I would. Bye, bye, bye. We bought some BlackRock today when it was down. The repository of the most money on earth opened up trading as high as 1057 That's a 43-point gain. And then sold off until it actually went negative. We swung into action for the Chapel Trust when that happened because BlackRock's offering funds that benefit from infrastructure spending and Bitcoin. Plus, there's private credit money. It's raising $1.3 billion right now to deploy as private credit. CEO Larry Fink thinks that banks and companies like his are increasingly doing the same thing. And his company has real advantages over the banks. I couldn't agree more. I was concerned that a Harris regime might crimp BlackRock's efforts. That's why we last night, well, was it just a gigantic win for BlackRock? Now, there are no sure things when it comes to anything related to housing, when mortgage rates are flying. But I think some stocks are all about rates coming down, even if it's short rates set by the Fed. And Home Depot is the number one stock you should reach for in a rate cut cycle. Remember, you can get a reasonable home equity loan to redo your home. It isn't called rehab and renovation for nothing. I think that Home Depot down almost $12. Tremendous opportunity. Of course, a lot of stocks that went down today deserve to go down. Super Micro reported last night. I am very, very worried about this company. Because its orders just resigned, specifically saying that they don't trust the numbers. Yesterday, we learned that the board conducted a review and found nothing untoward. To which I say, Ernst Young doesn't resign for nothing. Hey, by the way, memo to the company. Neither the SEC nor the Justice Department likes it when companies exonerate themselves. That's the job of the regulators. I see Supermicro losing a lot of business to HPE and Dell. Plus, it had a real bad quarter. Then we have the dollar stores. I wouldn't buy them. If there are gigantic tariffs put on Chinese merchandise, these guys will be gutted by their own dollar store ethos. I want to include Five Below here, which sources 60% of its goods from China. It works at as five below, but I, I wouldn't want it to go to 10 below. Over time, we'll find other stocks that have been unfairly whacked in response to the election, but this is as good a list as you can get until we know more about Trump's cabinet appointees. No matter what, when the Dow's up 1,500 points, people must look for laggers. You should, too. Alexa, like there's always a bull market somewhere, and I try to find it just for you right here at Mad Money. I'm Jim Kramer. See you tomorrow. 
All opinions expressed by Jim Cramer on this podcast are solely Cramer's opinions and do not reflect the opinions of CNBC, NBC Universal, or their parent company or affiliates, and may have been previously disseminated by Cramer on television, radio, internet, or another medium. You should not treat any opinion expressed by Jim Cramer as a specific inducement to make a particular investment or follow a particular strategy, but only as an expression of his opinion. Cramer's opinions are based upon information he considers reliable, but neither CNBC nor its affiliates and or subsidiaries will warrant its completeness or accuracy, and it should not be relied upon as such. To view the full Mad Money Disclaimer, please visit cnbc.com forward slash Mad Money Disclaimer.